Uh, where are we today? Where are we today? Mark is pretty quiet, man. It's pretty quiet, chugging along. Oh, the Dow. It almost got to 40K, didn't it? Almost got to 40K a couple of days ago. Backed off. One more strike. Yeah, I mean, listen, regardless of, you know, you can't be bearish when the price is almost, is at all-time highs on everything. You, 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 you can be, but, and you can plan a strategy for maybe when the market rolls over, which it will at some point. Market's never got forever. But you can't be, you know, you can't really be bearish and start playing the short game, in my opinion, when things are all-time highs. You know, there's better trades out there. If you want to short something, there's better stuff out there. Uh, who's watching Coco? It's, uh, uh, who, who thought you'd be saying that in in March of 2024? Coco. So Coco hit, hit 10,000 uh, not uh, earlier today. Random market, just it's just going nuts. It's a real it's a real supply demand issue that uh, obviously with commodities is a challenge with producing the commodity. So very different um, supply demand dynamics that you get compared to a stock or compared to a currency pair that you're trading, which is one uh, country against another, effectively one country's currency against another. The commodity has to be produced, and there's sometimes a supply chain issue. In the case of cocoa, it's an issue with the harvest, the crop, whatever it might be. So it's a different dynamic, and it's kind of interesting when you see some of these commodities just ripping off uh, to, to highs. So, yeah, it's a pretty quiet day today, isn't it? I think most people will be... Falling asleep, the Dow's not really doing a lot. Uh, yeah, oh gosh, really, really quiet. UST JPY or dollar yen is poised, sitting there, flagging near to highs. Will it go? It wants to, it's poised, it's coiled. Uh, we shall see. There's a lot of uh, other dynamics that are going on around that one. And what else have we got that's exciting before we start the webinar? We've got 30 seconds to skim through and see what's going on. Gold. Did did pop up? Uh, did kind of give that little little, little sniff above twenty two hundred. Came back down again a little bit today. I think it tagged it just about today. Backed off. Big flag. Longer the not necessarily the gold. I think we talked about gold last time on the webinar, right? But um, yeah, one thing with gold is, or one thing with a flag, and not sorry this this flag. But the longer the flag goes on, the less kind of tempted I am. I'm like, oh, you know, it was all right when we saw that. Um, you know, I think was an example I gave actually last week. That sort of declining flag um, popped up. That was just kind of the, the trade, if you like. And then you know, now it's just sort of sitting there. Will it go high? Will it go lower? You sort of lose the juice, lose the juice a little bit from it. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's get started. Six o'clock. We shall get rolling. And um, this is going to be another good one. Thanks for joining me, ladies and gents. Okay. So. Um, this is the Swing Traders Playbook, and nice little quote here from Seneca, which you've probably heard many times before. I'm going to put myself over there. Before I get started, actually, if you want to, uh, anything, want to, any question you'd like to add, you're very welcome to in the Q&A. get to those at the end. We'll do about 40, 45 minutes of this. Uh, I've got a lot of slides today, but the good slides, valuable stuff, um, pulled, out, pulled out the best stuff for you. Uh, you can ask the question I'll get to at the end. Um, I suppose you better do this, right? Risk disclaimer, please be aware, trading, especially when you're trading on leverage, you're trading on margin, you're trading on margin, uh, you can lose lots of money very, very quickly, and just as you can make lots of money very, very quickly. That's the game we're playing. That's the trade-off you, you take when you trade with margin. So just understand that, understand the product you're trading, understand what spread betting is, CFD. I know many of you are experienced traders, so um, perhaps this, you understand already, but if you're brand new to trading, then definitely, definitely, definitely understand the risk you're taking. If your brand spanking new, it might not be. You might be like, oh, maybe this isn't the perfect webinar for you. But maybe you can watch it, go back, come back again. You know, when you've um, got your mindset dialed in and everything like that. Okay, so let's get rolling. Uh, the Swing Traders Playbook. Okay, lots of stuff to cover today, so I'm going to get straight into it. Your biggest challenge may well be. Oh, by the way, introduce myself. Gosh, how rude of me! How rude of me! My name's Mark Holstead. Uh, for those who don't know me, those of you don't, who do know me. Um, thank you for showing up again and hopefully provide you a lot of value. If you don't know me, my name is Mark Holster. I've been trading for a couple of decades. I run Traders Mastermind. I have a daily email, do a podcast, do some videos on YouTube. I 
kind of come up with trading ideas and strategies and my own trading and all sorts of stuff. So anything to do with the markets, I've been doing it for a couple of decades plus. And I'd like to share with you my experiences, my thoughts, my ideas. And I also like to take other people's thoughts, comments, ideas, and seeing how people develop and get over hurdles and kind of take that and then present that to you and try and compile it and distill it down to something that will help you get to the next station, the next level, whatever you're trying to do in your trading. So your biggest challenge, this is Swing Traders Playbook, by the way, uh, which probably means that you are tight on time, right? You don't have time to be sat in front of the screens. You've got limited opportunity to trade. And you're trying to find a method that fits around your lifestyle, right? It doesn't cause you FOMO when you can't meet the screen. And this is meant to be, um, oh, you can do this with limited work. And, you know, this is a turnkey opportunity, all this. Non no, 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 no. We're not playing that game. We're serious about trading. We're serious about finding the right trades. And we're serious about learning a craft and a skill that's going to serve you for many years to come. And so when I say it doesn't need a lot of time, when I say it fits around your lifestyle, that's not meant to be some rah-rah marketing fluff that you might see on Instagram. This is meant to be, okay, you are running a business, you have a job, you have a family, whatever, you have commitments. And just by the nature of what you're already doing, if you want to trade, you're going to have to fit that in to what you're already doing, right? You can't, there's no give. We've all got a finite amount of resources, whether it's mental capacity, financial capacity, hours in the trading day, and they have to be allocated somewhere. And so when we say this, or when I say this, the idea is to say, hey, you maybe have a few hours here and there that you can devote to this craft and try to improve it and try to bring that skill level up over time whilst you're doing other things. So let's find a method that works for you. There's no point in going down rabbit holes on learning about intraday scalping and sitting in front of the screen all day because you just can't be, you can't do that. And maybe you don't even want to do that, right? That's fine as well. So when I say this, I say it from a perspective of let's solve for X when the problem is, or let's solve the problem. And the problem is you want to improve your trading the time is limited. So this may well help you today, or at the very least, hopefully it'll spark something in your mind that, hey, you go off and you start to think about other things, other ways to kind of move yourself forward. Because I, I know from running Traders Mastermind, I see lots of developing traders coming in, traders who are you know working in very high-end jobs, who've got a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, they're running businesses, all that type of stuff. And they get this FOMO when they can't beat the screen because they're trading a style of strategy that oh, I missed that opportunity, I missed this because I couldn't get to the screen, I was at work, I was on a meeting, I was this, I was traveling, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you don't want that. You want something that you can always fit in, a style that you can deploy with the, the lifestyle that you've got at the moment. So this is one I'm going to present to you today. And again, just my thoughts on stuff, never any recommendations. It's all never advice. Um, we can't be here giving advice out. I wouldn't want to be anyway. You've got to find your own path. And hopefully it's kind of just, just nudges you down the road and says, you know, try this, explore this. So that's what we're going to try and do. Um, and you're in luck because actually swing trading, yeah, yeah I think it's, it's pretty decent because you, you can leverage on the biggest moves. Day trading is great. And day trading has its own advantages, but there are disadvantages too, right? You've got to be in front of the screen. You've got to be very, very disciplined in day trading. It exposes your discipline and he chinks in that armor quite a lot, quite easily. So you've got to be kind of really dialed in. You've got to be, um, you know, so on point with day trading. The swing trading, you, you get the bigger moves, right? Yes, there's, there's, no, there's, there's no perfect solution here and it depends on what you're trying to do. But if you are limited on time, it's something to at least explore. You don't need to monitor your positions or markets all the time. You know, when you're in a trade, you kind of let the market work for you. Um, and and you kind of you can build a process that does require less time than say day trading. Now, people say is it less risky? Well, maybe, maybe it is. There's pros and cons, right? I'm not here to kind of sell one or the other. It's up to you to decide. But I think the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's it, it's something to consider. It's something to, to to go down the path and explore a little bit more. And you can use your lack of time as a bit of a superpower. Why I say that is many people have FOMO of missing out for not being in front of the screen, but actually not being in front of the screen can serve you because it means you're not over trading so much. You aren't seduced by that one minute candle spike. You aren't looking around for something to do when the market's doing absolutely nothing. You've got your process, you've set your trades, you've set your orders and you're done and you're off running your life, running your business, at your job, dealing with all you've got to deal with. And then you're kind of looking and surveying and observing, you know, your fields and your positions when you can. Okay. So today, the strategy that I'm going to share with you, I was going to share with you a few, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to go deep on one because it's my favorite at the moment. It's my favorite. I really like this strategy. Um, it's serving me well. 
And I think it's kind of got longevity as well. Sometimes I'll share some strategies. I'm like, yeah, this probably will run for a while. Maybe it will just chop and change. Um, you don't know. But this kind of is, is based on a really simple kind of concept. And the concept and the objective is this, is it's to, to catch a reversal pretty, pretty much. That's it. Catch it and hold it, right? We're not trying to be clever. We're not trying to do anything um, super smart here. We're just trying to catch a reversal, hold it, and and see where it takes us. And that's it. And I think with all trading, it pays to have a North Star, an objective of what you're trying to do, what strategy is you're trying to deploy does. You know, some strategies, sort of A to B trades, trading strategies, scalping strategies, you got your opening range breakout, your six o'clock shot, all this type of stuff, range break fakes. This is something that is very specific. It's a swing trading strategy. And you're just going to share with you the screening process. I'm going to share with you the filters, the triggers, and you take it and have a look for yourself. It might not be for you, and that's absolutely fine. It's not going to be for everyone, but I think it's something to explore because it's so specific and it's something that isn't so time consuming and so burdensome to scan for that, you know, it's something that pops up. And when it does pop up, I believe, you know, there's a decent edge in it. Okay. So here we go. Let's, let's kind of just throw a curveball out there. Does technical analysis even work? Eww. You know what? When it's used alone and you're just just focused on technical analysis, I think it's weak. And why I say this is because, you know, if you're just looking at a chart and you aren't taking the bigger picture and you're not looking at the context, I think that you're missing the biggest part of the puzzle. You know, we can look at a chart, we can dissect a candle and go, oh, yeah, you know, that's a you know hanging man there, and that's a double top here, and that's a head and shoulders here, and that's a flag, and and fine, they're all valid patterns to a certain extent, but used on their own, they're weak. And that's just my opinion on stuff. I know others others differ, but you know when you actually look at people who are true chartists, who are true technical analysts, they also you know will look at context. Linda Rashke is a perfect example. She loves her technicals, but she's a big, big fan of context. Right? She's super, super into context. And I think that your context and why the market's moving the broader movements, the market sentiment, all this type of stuff is so, so important. So I think something to be mindful of as we kind of move forward here in the next couple of slides is to just be careful that we aren't just overanalyzing stuff, that you're stepping back, context, context, keeping all everything in perspective. And you know, I, I, I truly believe this, and I've seen this in my own eyes, even my trading, other people's trading who I've been observing, the better results come when you do mix the technicals with kind of understanding the broader context and and really kind of putting the piece of the puzzle together. Okay, so context is king. If you haven't guessed, I believe context is king. It provides you with trading edge and knowing which markets have the right context is is most of the battle. Right. And and in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you how we how I filter for the right context and then deploy you know, maybe the, te the technicals, I guess, is the, maybe not the fully correct term there, but the setup in the right context. So I'm a big believer in this, whether you whether you think the strategy is BS or not, or whether you're not interested in this type of thing or whatever type of trading you want to deploy for yourself and your own trading uh, business or trading journey. You know, I think that thinking about, hey, how can I be in the right market at the right time and then use the tools, the technical tools and the triggers to, to actually get me on into the trade? That's a, I believe that's the correct way of thinking with trading. Find me the right market and then give me the tools to help me time that market better. That really, I believe, is this kind of sweet spot if there is such a, such a thing. I like using terminology like that because it's a bit, it sounds a bit cheesy, but hopefully you know what I mean by that. So, why is the higher time frame making the decisions? TF stands for time frame there. Why will someone buy the market after you? Because that's the only reason the market goes up, right? Someone's got to buy after you and start bidding up the price. And who cares? And I said this last webinar last week, and this is something that I think is such a simple, simple sentence. Um, it resonated with some of you saying, who cares? Like, who cares? Why would you care the price is sitting here? Now, at the moment, people who are long cocoa care, people who are short cocoa care, I'm talking about cocoa earlier, it's up at 10,000, it's an odd market, but it's just one of these markets going, well, Bitcoin's a great one. Everyone's kind of watching Bitcoin. People care. But then you look at something like, what was USD CAD or something, nobody cares, right? And it's just doing nothing. And so the edge has to be when someone cares. 
When the shorts care, the longs care, somebody cares. People care. There's a motive order flow, the supply demand imbalance, and it's our job as traders to capitalize on that supply demand imbalance. So we want to get into stuff that has a big shift in supply demand balance. So I'm going to sidetrack very briefly and, and just mention this. If you imagine you have a seesaw, right? Kids park, you know what it's like. There's a seesaw sitting there. You know, larger kid comes over, sits on it. Short kid comes over, it sits on it, doesn't go anywhere. The other one comes on, ah, finally, like two of the younger kids get it to move. You get the idea, right? And then he jumps off, the thing flies the other way, and then someone else comes over and he jumps. You know how it works, right? It's just a pivot in the middle and it's ping ponging back and forth, depending on who's coming on, the weight of the person coming on, et cetera, and how many people are on. Get the idea. Price is no different. Buyers and sellers are coming on and off all the time, this seesaw. And when a big seller is sitting on there, right, a big heavy kid is sitting on there, or a big kid, if you like, an older kid is sitting on there, and you've got all these buyers sitting on there, or younger kids are sitting balanced, it's not going anywhere, all of a sudden he's doing, I'm done, I'm going home now, the seller's going home, and he gets off, what happens? Bang! The seesaw just shifts massively in the other direction. And that's kind of the visualization we have when we're looking at price, right? So supply, demand, shift, 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 sellers and buyers sitting there, maybe it's happy medium, then bang, kind of moves the other way. So, let me introduce you uh, the strategy that I call backdraft. So here's a thesis. The market's moved really significantly in one direction. It's had little to no pullback. And your objective is to identify that market, or I call the stretch spring, if you like, or if the sea source moved really heavily in one direction, pick the reversal sweet spot, and ride the counter trend snap. And the backdraft, if you know what backdraft is, kind of when the fire looks like it's out, it looks like, you know, that room's safe and all of a sudden the oxygen hits it and ends up, you know, causing kind of big explosions and all sorts of stuff. So the idea of this is that, you know, we're trying to catch the turn. And yes, I am very cognizant, but this goes against everything the textbooks tell you. Textbooks say, don't try and catch a falling knife. Don't stand in front of a freight train. And those are all true. Right, they're all true. We're not just stabbing at stuff saying, oh, it's gone too far. I'm going to go long. No, no, no. We have a, a method for catching this. And, and maybe you'd agree with me on this before we kind of you know, dig into the kind of nuances of this. Um, you know, at that point, people care, right? If the markets move significantly to the downside, say, all the longs are trapped, all the longs are hurting. And I'm sure it's quite happy, but there's a definite kind of stuff happening, there's, you know, there's things going on. Excuse me, sir. Oh, excuse me, guys. That's, that's, a, that's a cough. I felt it tickling me. It was gathering there. I was like, right, I'm going to have to pause and, and, and just cough. So apologies for that. Let me go back to what I was saying. You know, the textbooks will say, don't stand in front of the freight train. Don't kind of try and catch a falling knife. And I agree. You don't just want to stab at this, but if you can time it, I think you recognize that actually if you can time this and you can find ways of kind of minimizing the risk and, and finding these opportunities and little clues that may be determined that actually that could be the end of the move, then you can get these decent snapbacks. And and you know what? Trading's a funny thing. If you are focused on doing one thing and you give yourself your mind that objective, then that often you find that answer to that thing. If you give yourself too much to do, like I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to jump on the trend, I'm trying to do this and the other, then you struggle. It was a quote, and I tried to find it, from uh, Paul Tudor Jones. And Paul Tudor Jones, very famous trader, he basically said this. He said, I am very good at spotting turns in trends. Very, very good. But I'm not. So this was ages ago. So I mean, you evolve as a trader, right? I'm very good at spotting those turn in trends. I'm very good at uh, kind of taking that first 10% of the shift in trend. And after that, I'm gone. You know, I'm not so good at holding the trend. And that was interesting, right? Because he specialized in spotting that reversal. He specialized in spotting when the spring was really, really stretched. When it was about to turn, he had these little clues and he went in and he and he kind of when he got it, he was like, right, I've got it. I'm on, I've got it. I've got the turn. I'm so focused on catching that. Great. And so he became a specialist in that. And then obviously he went on to do many other things. I'm sure he got very, very good at holding the trend, but it was something he'd said in his early career. That's what he was kind of good at, if you like. So uh, where are we? Okay, so filters. 
we want a major market. This doesn't really work in smaller markets. We don't interested in small caps. We're not interested in kind of things that are illiquid and, uh, and, and not traded very well. We want major markets. Um, and we want an extended move. I don't know why I've added it in there. Uh, extended move to the downside. Now, it tends to work better to the downside, both for FX, because you're trading a pair, right? So I think it works both ways for FX, upside and downside. But for most other things, it, it has to be the downside because just the way that the psychology of human nature is and the way that, that things kind of are priced and the way that people own certain stocks or they own the index or they own something. So downside is what really I, I believe you stick to. You can do both for currencies, but that, are you doing indices or are you doing kind of the higher uh, major stocks, um, or higher, higher market cap stocks? You want no pullbacks. You want sharp, aggressive action. Got loads of chart examples for you in a moment, so hopefully it will become clear. Well, no pullbacks, sharp, aggressive action. Okay, so let me give you an example here. We've got uh, Dolly Yen. You've had really aggressive 700 pip move in six days on a major currency, right? No pullbacks, relentless, one-way street. Now, it will turn eventually. If you're stabbing at it, that's not the way to do it. We're going to talk about how we can potentially time these and some of the clues in a moment, but I want to get you think, seeing in your mind what I mean by this steep decline. It's a steep move. It's an un unusual move. There's no pullback, and it's multiple days. I'm normally saying about five-plus days is my, is my personal thought. It's up to you. Five-plus days. We don't want grinding. We don't want just chopping about. We want aggressive, one-way. Think of the seesaw. Bang. Massive selling, massive selling, massive selling, massive selling. Okay, steep decline, one-way street. That's what we want. 700 pip move in six days. That's a lot. That's a big move. Okay. So uh, examples of what we don't want. We don't want this. It's not enough. It's too long and it's not persistent enough. A couple of days is not it. Not on this. We don't want any of this stuff. This is, too, this is too shallow. Not interested in that. Even though it's kind of multiple days, it's not enough. We want extension, extension, extension. None of these are any good. Different, 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 different to this type of thing. Yeah, I'm trying to get my mouse. I'm slipping around all over the place here. Different to that. Okay, another example I've got for you. Natural gas. By the way, I didn't, I didn't trade that yet. I did trade this natural gas. Uh, big, big monster move here. But this is the move that's more interesting. S persistent selling multiple days in a row. Down, 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 down. One-way street. Major decline. Major market. Sorry. Steep decline. That is going to turn at some point, right? It's not going to go to zero. I was very unlikely to go to zero. I say never say never because crude oil went negative. If those of you guys remember that. But the point is, you know, when it's a major market, which is why it's important, the spring is stretched, but it's going to snap back. It's not like we're talking about some sort of small stock that's in bankruptcy or has a profit warning and the company's going to go bust. We're not trading those. We're trading big companies or big indices, not going to be a small index, but you get the idea, major pairs, um, you know, commodities, that type of stuff. And stuff that you probably trade yourself. Anything you trade yourself, you need that because there needs to be some demand for it somewhere. You can get stocks, little companies that no, there's no demand for it, right? So that's that's the key. Steep decline, one-way street. And I guess if you're kind of um, authorized to, to trade crypto, some of the main uh, major crypto uh, currencies would do that too. Gold, again, perfect example on this. Major market, steep decline, one-way street. I'm going to show you the triggers in a moment, but I want to kind of give you the example of you know, what we're looking for, the filter, if you like, the primary reason to kind of say, yeah, you know what, context is good. And going back to that initial slide, we want context. We want to know that people care. People care about this. People care that gold's gone from 1920 down to 1820. It's had a big, fat move. People care about that, okay? And this, this, was, this was quite a while ago, but I kind of pinning pin out some of the stuff or picking out some of the stuff that helps you um, identify this better. Major market, steep decline, one-way street. All right, so the backdraft triggers. So you might be like, yeah, all right, Mark, that's great. Uh, we can all buy, let's all buy the low. Yeah, aren't we geniuses? Let's all buy the low. Let's all margin ourselves up to the hill and buy the low. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, of course, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah. But we're trying to reverse engineer what we, what we, what our, our goal is. Our goal is to try to attempt to get that reversal. So we're going to reverse engineer and go, okay, what does the end of the move tend to look like? What are the telltale signs and clues that happen at the end of that move? 
And how can we kind of trigger into the trade by reducing the risk? We've got our stop in a sensible position and give us the most upside possible. Because if we can get in a position where, you know, we have a 70% chance of it popping back up, then that's great because if we can get a, you know, multiple risk reward ratio as well, that's a strategy that's effective, long-term efficacy. That's great. You know, and it's all about timing this and I get it. But it's the context first. We want that stretch spring. We want to see it moving. We want to see that a lot of people have been running for the hills, the longs and running for the hills for a week or so, five trading days, right? Now, triggers. I'm going to go through these in a moment and kind of going through the nuances and stuff. Intraday reversal, low break and reclaim, exhaustion candle, support break, exhaustion gap. They sound nice in, in theory, but let's look at the nuances. Okay, so I call this one a support below support. And this is really, we had this on, on the yen um, not long ago, really, we, we kind of pushed back and we we're kind of pulling down really, really hard. And why I call support below support is very often we will find support, but not really at a whole number or a key level or a, or, or a kind of big number, like, you know, 35,000 Dow, 40,000 would be obviously we haven't touched that yet. Your know, whole number on crude oil, 147 yen, uh, you know, some whole big number. Now, why? Because, you know, a lot of people use that as a benchmark, a reference point. Some of the institutions will use that as a benchmark and a reference point to get into the trade. Um, there are just many, multiple reasons why. And if you're approaching that from a long distance from above, then very often you'll go through because the momentum is so, so strong. You can see the kind of charts we're looking at. The momentum is just is brutal. And that's why it comes the old adage, don't stand in front of a freight train. That's not what we're trying to do at all. We're trying to find a point where that freight train is going to derail and it's going to ping back the other way. So we're not just stabbing at this or catching a falling knife. We're trying to be strategic about looking immediately about when, how far it's gone first, and then trying to find some sort of reversal pattern there. Okay, so support below support. This is something I've, I've observed uh, in the last few years that happens way more often than not. You know, you've got a, a key level, a whole number level, or something that's significant from that perspective, right? It might not be a chart-based support, but it's a whole number support, or it's something that's meaningful. And the market will just go through it. I'll right? just go through it. But it will often ping back up to it. It's almost like it's a magnet and sucks price back up. And so this is a great example on yen not long ago where – it kind of went through, almost went, well, it did go to 146.50, came back up to 147, 146.50. It kind of, you got a support level that was below the real support. And then that kind of magnet acts, it kind of acts like a magnet to suck price back up and back over and catapulted it back up to highs. Something to watch out for is, you know, I personally would never just, you know, put a, level, a limit order in at a low or a support level. I want to see how it behaves. And it kind of stretches through, comes back up. You can, you can kind of think, okay, Feels like there's some buyers there. No buyer wants to stand in front and just pay 147 when they can get 146 and a half, even if they want to buy you know, billions and billions and billions, right? They, they don't want to do it. I can get as cheap as possible. But that starts to stall things. That starts to be the couple of the kids getting off the seesaw and just maybe maybe leveling it out a bit. So that's that analogy, by the way. So that's 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 a really good one to look out for. Support below support. Um the other one is is what I call like a, a dip drive, and dip drive is is you know, when we go through a prior day's low, and then we pop back up aggressively. So at the end of the move, and by the way, if you look at these here, so this is let me go back to the daily charts on these. Um, uh, did, did I have the daily chart on this one? There we go, gold. So this is on gold, right? The big big move, lower, lower, lower. Fine. Let's see how it reverses now. Yesterday's low here, and actually the one we got stopped out. You would have got stopped out on your first bite of the cherry. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And then the second one worked well. But the things you can quantify easily, you can quantify the risk. So you can have a couple of bites of the cherry. Yesterday's low, dips through, big volume, last bit of volume flush, big range bar, and we close at highs. That's important to see that. I like to see that. Next day, gapped up, you're off to the races. And that was after the big, big move lower, right? We had a big move. Uh, I'm going through the wrong way. We had a big move lower. There it is, big move lower, big, big move lower. Then you see that reversal. And, and that's key because you're not trying to be smart. You're just trying to say, hey, big move lower. This won't last forever. How do I time this? How do I get on and really um, you know, leverage on these on these triggers or leverage on the technicals within the context of the bigger move, right? Again, we're going back to that point of the context. 
dipping below the low, pops back up. And this happens loads, right? Just like support under support, this happens a lot where it will take out the prior day's low, find a bid, and then reverse. Almost like the sellers go, I've had enough now. It's the last, last flush, last hurrah, buy a step in. And ideally, you want it to close strong on the day, ideally. Now, if you've got something that trades 24-5, you can kind of go, all right, maybe I'll get away with this. It's slightly different because if I remember right, it was a Friday. So you have to be like, eh, okay, if you're taking this, you want you want to kind of be mindful that it could be over a, a weekend gap. And of course, that comes in with your risk management, all that other stuff. Okay, next one, exhaustion gap. Very often, uh, I say very often, not as often as the others, but it's there. Another way to time this is look for an exhaustion gap. The market's moved. You've got your market stretched. You filter. You made your market. You steep decline. You one-way street. Stretch, 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 stretched. One final bang. Exhaustion gap is the textbook terminology for it. And that first opening print is very often the low, as it was with Natty not very long ago. Exhaustion gap. It was at that low. Final flush. And yes, this wasn't as aggressive. Trains never perfect. You're never going to get textbook stuff. Well, you do now and then. It's nice, but you know this is okay because it did gap lower, found a bid, held that bid, didn't really revisit, didn't really close the highs as such. But it was later on it kind of started to turn the wheels turn. It's not a perfect example, but it's a recent one and it's it was quite apt. It's one I traded myself, so it kind of good to good good to kind of uh, you know run through it and show what's going on. The exhaustion gap at the end of the move is often a sign that maybe that's the end. And the beauty of this, the beauty of this, if you look at all of these, the obvious place for your stop is at the at, the, 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 at that anchor point. If you say, I'm waiting for an exhaustion gap, where, and you see, you don't know where it's going to be at the time, right? You can see it opening low, going, I don't know, it's going to be an exhaustion gap. But then when it pops back, pops, rallies hard, you go, okay, Maybe I can have a little nibble here with a stop below that low. Maybe that's not that bad. There's not much risk. And when I put it in the context of what I'm trying to get, when I look back on Natty here, and you kind of hear this is exhaustion gap here, and I think about the context of maybe I can get a snap back to two, which was kind of my thinking, then, then the risk reward is massive. And I believe you've got the high probability of success of the trade as well because you've waited like a sniper for that string to be so, so stretched in a major market. It's got to come back at some point. And let's look at some of the clues that will help us decide when it's going to come back. Exhaustion gap's a great one. And if it doesn't work and it fails, then you've not, you've not lost a lot in the context of what you're trying to do in the risk reward of a trade. Same with the dip drive. Right, it dips below, pops back up. Even if you took it above this high here, it stops very, very, very small and shallow compared to what you can potentially achieve. And that's the name of the game with this. Uh, and same with support below support as it comes back up to there. You think it's reclaimed? You not got much risk. And that's what you're trying to do: trying to structure the trade so you have the least amount of risk possible with the biggest amount of upside. And if you can get the odds on your side, okay. So, all right, we've got time. Good. Process. If you can't trade the intraday trigger, and you might be there thinking, this is the whole point of this market is that you know people who haven't got time to be sitting there watching this stuff. Yeah, I get it. But and if you're there and you can watch it, then great. Then you've got these opportunities, and there's others that I just couldn't have time to include. But kind of with the context, the context is the most important. Okay, if you can't be there, you could do this. You scan for the multi-day big movers, and you can use eyeball and kind of scan through trading view, or you can load. Pepperstone, if you use Pepperstone as a broker, their products into a portfolio in FinViz and screen for those. Quite easy to do that. Very, very simple. Um, or you just end up, you know what's moving, right? This is not something you're going to get every day. You're probably going to get it every week. But it's the kind of thing that you can be keeping your eye on. You go, hey, listen, that's swinging. That's coming into my filter. That's had a five-day big move. I want to watch it. And then you watch it every evening. You watch it, you watch it, you watch it. And what you do is, yes, maybe you can't be there to capture the intraday change, but every day you look at the intraday chart and you go, did I see any of this? Did I see an exhaustion gap that closed here? Because you're going to see review it here, assuming you're going to review at the end of the day or you're going to review in the morning, whatever it is. You're going to have seen this and go, actually, the context is correct. The trigger's correct. Okay, I'll, I'll have a little nibble there. And so you're waiting for the right opportunity to strike. Your risk is managed because you can put it under that under that anchor point and your upside is is pretty decent, I think. Same if you saw kind of the dip drive. Yeah, all right. It might not be the very the best, most opportune trading moment that you can absolutely have if you're watching intraday, but there's still so much meat on the bone 
And the fact that you've screened for the context and then you've screened for the trigger like this gives you, I believe, more edge. Same with the support below support. You see this pattern and you kind of see it close here. You go, oh, do I really want it? Well, maybe I'll put a stop limit, uh, sorry, stop entry order in above this high. You can structure it and you know how to structure orders and kind of place limits and stops, et cetera, to get into the trade. And if you look at any of these, you know, even if you're late at the close here, there's so much upside. And I, I recognize these, these are kind of examples, uh, recent examples. Not everyone's like this, but, you know, you can be a day, you can be at the end of the day and still have potential. You can still have decent potential in the trade. Okay. So, um, let me run through the next thing. So there's your process. You can't trade intraday. It's scan. You look for that screening process, which is, hey, five big days in a row, big mover. Has it done this? Has it had one of these reversal patterns? Yes, it has. And this, and you know what? Something to, to mention here. You've got to be prepared for this, right? These won't fall into your lap. It's not a lot of work. They're not going to fall into your lap. But I believe that if you can focus on the stuff that has the stretch spring and it stretches stretch and stretch and you do a snap back and you're trying to time it then you're in a great position a great position if you can't be sitting in front of the screen all day long okay one thing to note here is uh catalyst driven trades so any reversals triggered by a catalyst earnings central bank statements are really good it feels like a chase but when it's a stretch spring and then you get a catalyst in the other direction two examples in a moment for a couple of stocks Often it just a re, it's a, a complete reprice, reprices the, the asset massively. And going back to that initial point, who cares? Well, now you've just changed the potential valuation of that company or the potential valuation of that economy, whatever it might be. And then a lot of people care. So you do often get these runs. Um, so Netflix driven lower, lower, lower. It's not quite the setup. The point was if that had been stretch, 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 earnings catalyst up, you still feel like you're chasing so early in the move same with roku stretch 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 it feels like it's so late in the moves like chase him but there's plenty there so don't rule out a catalyst based move that shoves it back in one direction okay so um i wanted to touch on this very briefly maybe this is this is probably another webinar but i did say i was going to cover a few different ways of sort of swing trading um and one of them is you know the backdraft and having strategies like that and the other is simple data-driven rule-based stuff. So if you can't be in front of the screen all the time and you want to have a strategy to deploy, then one way of doing it is to, rather than using the technicals and trying to judge for yourself, and if they're working for you, great, but if they're not been working for you, maybe try something else. And that is, there's, a, there's, there's certain uh, rules and patterns out there that are back-tested and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're pretty thorough. Right now, of course, just because it happens in history doesn't mean it's going to happen in the future. But this is this stuff is pretty robust historically and can help you. Like a great example is what is playing out right now. And again, I never I, I'm never giving out trade advice or any of this type of stuff. But you've kind of got a, today is a Tuesday, and turnaround Tuesday is a anomaly, if you like, that says if Friday and Monday if Friday and Monday was weak, very often if you buy on the Monday, you get a rally on the Tuesday. Right? That's a turnaround Tuesday. It's been back tested. It's a high heaven by all the data geniuses out there. It's just something you could deploy. You could say, right, I'm going to trade turnaround Tuesday. I'm going to scan for week Friday, week Monday, and, and whatever other metrics you want. So that's one way you could trade things. Another one is if you want to trade less frequently, there's another statistic out there that says there's a seven day trading period at the end of the month and the beginning of the next month is often bullish. And now, again, You've got to manage your risk, got to do all this stuff, and, and history doesn't always determine what's going to happen in the future, of course. But you can use these stats, and we're, we're in it right at the moment. You buy at the close of the fifth last trading day of the month and exit in the third trading day. So you kind of have that seven-day trading window, and, of, and often September's the weakest. And again, this is stuff for you to dig into yourself. I'm just kind of throwing it out there and saying these are statistically feasible strategies that have efficacy in history and they're pretty decent the kind of numbers are pretty strong so you if you traded them if you chose to trade them you chose to kind of allocate capital to these ideas you'd obviously assume that these would continue now do they always continue and you know you can have a you know, four or five in a row don't work so you've got to kind of still accept these aren't holy grail stuff but that's one way of doing it if we're trying to solve for x and x being you don't have time to sit in front of the screen all day long trading 
One is to have a strategy like backdraft or another strategy of your choice. Another is to train in a data-driven rule-based approach. We don't have to think just following a rule-based system. I believe, by the way, that the perfect scenario for this is when you blend these together and you say, hey, I've got a strategy that's technical-based. I've got a rule-based strategy. This is suggesting that today is going to be bullish. I've noticed a bullish pattern on the chart here. I'm going to go long. I'm going to manage my risk with a stop. I'm going to, I feel like those two are going to combine to blend together to give me a decent edge. The Santa rally, of course, we've heard about this and stuff like, you know, if you're buying uh, some of the major markets when the RSI is under 10 uh, and, you, and you can sell when the close is greater than yesterday's high. So it's kind of overbought stretch spring type thing again. But the point is you can find all these for yourself very, very easily and choose to operate in a data driven way or choose to add this as a as into the mix so that you can use it to kind of support your trading. And again, we're doing this because trying to solve the problem of you don't have time to sit there and scan and do this and do that. So it's one way of you know leverage on the time that you have and say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a data driven rule based approach. Um uh, yeah, by the way, there's loads and loads of these back tested themes. You test them and trade for yourself. And, and I think layering to existing strategies is the, the way to do it. Okay, so a couple of final slides, and then we'll I'll take a few questions if, you, if you've if you got them, uh, guys. The swing trader's mindset. Thinking in terms of probabilities, fine. I think most people get this. You know, swing trading can be a little bit testing in that you've put a lot of weight on the trade, and, oh, is the outcome going to be good? I've waited for this opportunity. I've waited an extra day for this. Pull the trigger. Oh, stopped. You know, you've got to kind of think, okay, this is one of many. I'm just going to try and let this play out. And hopefully this is this has edge. It's got over 10, 20 trades. You know, it's going to give me going to be a positive expectancy. Be strict with your rules. There's no point in waiting and waiting and waiting and then breaking your rule. And also the final thing here is just more effort into each trade you take. So what I mean by this is if you're focused on getting a reversal in that market, then focus on that. Don't get distracted by something else. Say, what's happened today? What's the price action been like today? You know, how can I really leverage this? You know, can I add some more size if it goes my way? How can I do this? Um, and, you, and you just don't know if that trade, when you're swing trading especially, is going to be the trade that does make your month, your quarter. You just don't know. And, you know, I wanted to, wanted to mention this quickly. I, I, I think I, I did a podcast episode when I talked about this, or maybe it was on my daily emails. And I really do believe this, is that you can luck strikes anywhere, right? We can't, we kind of when luck gonna kind of gonna strike, and as a trader, we're kind of exposed to luck, good luck and bad luck. Sometimes you've had seemingly good luck. We've kind of been a market. Maybe it's ripped off in your favor. Maybe you had bad luck where it's just ping, just stop and kind of reverse or whatever it might be. You've been in a trade where some bad news has come out. With swing trading, you can kind of put yourself in a position to benefit from luck. You can't guarantee luck, of course you can't. But what I mean by this is, if you're running those winners. And if you're in winning trades and you're cutting and losers short, the trades you're in, you've got the opportunity for luck to come and say, okay, yeah, reversal's come in. I've got the reversal. Then some news comes out that helps boost the price or whatever it might be. And because you're in the winning trade already, that's just going to boost your kind of PL on the trade. But if you're cutting the loser, then you know, you're not going to get the bad luck hammering you even more. Now, of course, you could have a trade that goes unrealized PL, it's nice and bad luck hits you. Fine, that happens. But Running the winners and cutting the losers, obviously statistically good and mathematically good, but it helps you benefit from luck. And one thing I like to think about, kind of another point here, is, is, is a flight analogy. And I've talked about this many times before, so I won't rabbit on about this, but I like to get the trade off, off the runway, right? It's the most riskiest time. Get it into the cruise. Then when it's in the cruise, let the market work for me. I've done the hard work. The engines are at full thrust. Now I'm cruising. I've got time to... Kind of hit a bit of hit a bit of turbulence. I've got time for to deal with any problems. It's okay, but just getting the trade off the runway and then letting the market work for me to the destination, and then concentrate on landing as in the exit of the trade. The flight analogy being: Hey, the entry is important. Focus, focus, focus. Get the entry. Get a couple of days under my belt. Relax a little bit. Will we stop to break even? There's no risk now. The risks are you know, very, very low. I consider it to be. And then I can relax a bit, let the market work for you. Um, so some extra final notes on this. Always research the play. Is there a why? Think about that why. Who cares? Got to use a stop on this. And obviously, we didn't go through so much risk management. We didn't really have much time. But obviously, 
putting a stop on those anchor points is a good way place to start. Double check headline risk. You don't want to be in something that's just got battered because of earnings or news or something like that. You want something that's major, that's moved just from supply to mine imbalance. Never add to a loser with this with that strategy specifically. And I don't think with any strategy, you should be adding to a loser. Have a fixed number of times you'll try. So bites to the cherry. If you get stopped twice, maybe you don't take a third because you're wrong. Fine, leave it. And I believe if the trade is acting well, just hold it. That's how you make the decent returns on this type of uh, this strategy. Get in the right trade. The risk is quite low. And you're like, hey, I'm in this trade here now. And, and you know, it's got a massive upside. I feel like there's a good reversal happening here. Sit with it. Hold it. You know, this is the sort of thing that can really make your monthly quarter. And I believe as well, trading around a core position is acceptable on this. So adding to the trade, peeling some off, and using that core that you've got the great entry to kind of leverage on more stuff and really focusing on that one play. Um, so summary, context is king. Focus on one trade at a time. Try and get the trade off the runway and, and take advantage of luck. Position yourself for luck. And that really means holding your winners. If you're in your winners and you're holding the winners and you're in the right place at the right time, then often you just, sometimes you get lucky and you don't know when it's going to strike, but it does help a trader because it's a little bit of a boost to the PL. Okay. So I'll take a few questions, ladies and gents. Thank you so much. Um, oh, good. I've seen idea now to promote my promotes free uh free daily email i send out every morning at 7 30 a.m hopefully it's there to help you develop consistency momentum discipline ideas thoughts comments some quotes all this other good stuff uh there's seven or eight thousand people in there now and everyone seems to be enjoying those so make sure you sign up for that you can go to treasmastermind.com top right daily email or forward slash email enter your email in there if you don't like it you can unsubscribe no hard feelings i get it all right, so let me go to the Q and A. Gary Portugal, how are you doing, Gary? Let's move you here so I can give you some eye contact, ladies and gents. Gary Portugal says, "I think it's a good point not to rely solely on charts. Let's take fundamentals into consideration." Yeah, you know what, Gary? A lot of people are so anti this. So, like I'm a technical trader, I'm a technical trader, fine. You know, if it's working for you, fine. But if it's not working, then really consider, you know, what's driving the market and the reason behind the move. You know, something called the the, the, the prop trading guys, and I mean like the physical trading prop guys, uh, you know, would say, what's the intraday fundamentals? Like, what's the intraday fundamentals? It's like, what? What the, what the, what the hell is intraday fundamentals? Well, that is like, what's driving it? And that could be as simple as we're all waiting for Fed. So this is why this market is doing nothing. Or it could be that recently there was a surprise interest rate cut or, you, or there was a change in this or everyone's looking at the war or everyone's got eyes on you know, whatever it might be. There's, there's often that, and that's the intraday fundamental. So when we're swing trading as well, context is king. People in uh, top floor office blocks with billions of assets under management aren't taking a trade based on a trend line break. You know, they're taking a trade based on the fundamentals of that company or that country, whatever it might be. Now, of course, there are some exceptions. I get it. Some out there that are trading, you know, some kind of technical short-term strategy, fine. But, you know, majority of money's moved based on what they think the earnings of the company are going to be, where they think it's going to go in the future, what they think the yield's going to be in this. So that's why this stuff tends to work, you know, in the majors is that, you know, people are making decisions not based on technicals, but based on something else. So, yeah. Um. Sindri says where to get fundamental information about the market. Hey, Sindri, you know what the best thing to do is just to follow, just to, you know, screen first for, for technicals, like if the market's moving in a big direction, and then just go and do some Googling. Like, you know, Coco, you can, an example, because it's happening right a second, um, you can say, right, and, and by the way, I, I think, you know, it's the wrong way for the actual trade setup. Shame, but hey. Um, you know, you go and you say, right, well, that's moving. That's kind of four or five days in a row. I, that's on my watch list. Why is it doing it? Well, there's not really much of an, anything reason behind that. Or it's just nothing. Okay, you know, fine. It's I think it might be worth considering. So you don't have to be like an economist. You don't have to be a genius. I think it's just worth paying attention and being, keeping your finger on the pulse. Um, Jacob says, hi, Mark. Great webinar as always. Thank you, Jacob. Do you keep track of how your strategies are working at the moment? Or do you... Or do you do a quick back test? How do you know if the strategy is all right to use when you're not monitoring it all the time? Um, I will always, you know, this one specifically, Jacob, I'll always trade it. I know it's worked well for me. Um, it makes sense. It's just one of those things. It doesn't happen very often, right? This is why it's under the, the title of kind of swing trading playbook because 
It's not something you're going to get every day. And I don't think it's, it's as effective. If it's, it's certainly not as effective if you're using a short time frame chart because the move is is shorter and we often get these trend days. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I, I bucket my strategies, I label my strategies, I mark off my strategies. I, I kind of have a little bit of gut feel of whether what strategy I'm going to deploy for the week or the month. Um, you know, I don't want to overload myself from spreading myself too thin. You know, and also it goes a little bit with how I feel. Sometimes I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be sitting there day trading stuff. I'm just going to wait for this opportunity. I feel like that's the best opportunity for me this month. I'm going to put all my energy into that. And I'm going to focus on that. Other times I might be like, hey, you know what? The market's swinging around nicely. You know, I need to be on the on, on the open. I need to be watching this. I need to trade the opening range breakout, whatever it is. I think it's just kind of going with you know, what you see going with a bit of experience and also going with how you feel about stuff as well. Sometimes you just think, I don't want to be sitting in front of the screen all day long. The market's not really offering that much opportunity, which is fine. Other days you might be like, yeah, I've got to be there, I've got to be there, I've got to be there. Uh, Varuna says, thanks, Mark. Can this strategy be used on lower time frames? Ah, I didn't even know that question was coming, Varuna. No, it can't, I'm afraid. Um, well, I believe it can't. Uh, the reason why is because it relies on the higher time frame money coming. No one really cares. Well, that's not true. A lot of people don't care if the market moves persistently down, you know, five 15 minute candles in a row. That's a bit of a move and it could pop up. And actually, you know, maybe yes, you could you could have an ex a kind of exhaustion strategy based on that. But the fact that it closes and the and the market's technically closed, depending on what you're trading, gives type people time to think and people time to potentially get their, their orders in and, and got to shift the momentum back the other way. So uh I think I said no, didn't I? But maybe it does. Maybe it does. But that's probably there's probably so many different tweaks that it looks like a very different strategy. There is exhaustion strategies, to be fair, yes, intraday, but they look very, very different. Um, so this one, as it is, no exhaustion strategies intraday, yes. Maybe we'll cover those at some point. Um, Victor says thank you. Gary says spot on. Cheers, Mark. Cheers, Gary. Simon Strut says when trading the daily time frame, how many pips stop is desirable? Um. A good, a good kind of. It depends on what you're trying to do, right, Simon. If you are, um, you know, you're trying to look for like a four or five day move, then maybe you say, "What's the ATR?" And I, I, I what's the average true range? And I use like, oh, I like to use a ten. So what's a ten day ATR? What's the average range of the last ten days? And that's a good place for a stop. Maybe if I'm trying to time it better, I use a quarter of that. Twenty five percent of the ATR is pretty decent. If I'm using like an intraday entry and trying to turn it into a swing trade, if it's a pure swing trade, you probably want to get the day right. And if you want to get the first day right, then probably you want to use the stop, you know, um, the average range of the day. I Some of you might go, oh, that's a little bit wide. And it is, but I always like to uh, err on the side of width with my stop to develop the strategy and then kind of fine tune it and maybe tighten things up. And maybe realize actually I'm quite good at spotting the turn there. I don't have to be so wide rather than starting with the strategy so narrow, getting stopped out all the time, getting frustrated, discarding the strategy and going, well, you know what? I'm not going to trade that again. So slightly wider was the way that I like to approach it. And you can kind of bring it in. Uh, and one thing you can do, Simon, as well, is you can start with a kind of standardized stop of a function of ATR. So an average range or 50% of the range or whatever it might be. And then you know, as the trade starts to go your way, you can find a structured place to drag it either, you know, below some support plus a decent cushion, never like it just below support these days, you know, or something like that. Or as you peel off half, maybe you bring the stop up. So you can kind of play around with that. It's like a, you know, stops, I like to think of stops more, more, more dynamic than it just is just static. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, Mike says, uh, okay, to use CFDs for this type of swing. Yeah, absolutely. Mike. Perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, CFDs and spread better fine unless you're holding for I don't know what the number is these days months right it's months isn't it and, and you know most people aren't trading from it's something like nine ten months or something when you when you're thinking of the cost of uh, your swap and all that type of stuff but yeah perfect type of thing for this just be careful of course if you are trading on margin that you don't go crazy because Depending on the instrument you've got, you do have a little bit of overnight risk. If you're trading on Thursday, hold it for Friday, you've got weekend risk. So it's something to consider. So you don't want to be too heavy on stuff because you do kind of, as soon as you go into the weekend and that bell goes, then you, know, you are giving up your risk control and you've got to appreciate that. It can work for you and against you. In that example, I think was it natural gas, we it worked for you, but it can work against you as well. So 
something to be aware of most of the things and also stocks obviously the bell goes you can't trade those overnight so overnight you are exposed to risk but generally speaking yeah uh cfd is perfect i believe okay uh will be uploaded to the pepstone youtube yeah uh, probably i think they do most of them yeah i think they do most of them so yes you can uh re-watch it there and as you watch on youtube hello to you Maybe come on the live one next time. All right. Thank you, ladies and gents, for jumping on the live webinar. I think I've got everybody there. Yes, I have. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your uh, attention. It's always nice to speak to people who are actually live and, you know, know someone at the other end who is hopefully finding value from this. Hopefully you took some notes. Hopefully this is going to be useful to you in your training. I shall see you again very soon. Take care. Keep the risk managed. Bye-bye for now.